Okay, hello everyone. Um, as usual, I'm gonna. Oh boy, I'm not even moving at all here. As usual, I'm gonna start by asking if there's questions. Oh. Oh, right, the CalPerg announcement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Yes, hi. I'm Natasha. And I'll remove the spotlight on me. Spotlight. Okay. Thank you for letting me speak. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Natasha, and I'm a second year MCD bio and legal studies major. And I'm also one of the Zero Hunger Coordinators with CalPERG students here at UCSC. Yeah, I'm here to tell you about remote volunteer and internship opportunities to make social change in our community. So let me post a quick link in the chat for you all. Okay, so everyone should fill that out to sign our petition to fight climate change. So yeah, let me tell you about us, our priority campaign to protect the environment, and then ways you can get involved. So to say this past year has been challenging is an understatement. But coming out of the 2020 election with record youth turnout, we know our generation can make a big impact and shape the future of this country. And that's what CalPerg does. CalPerg is a statewide student board that started here at the UCs in the 70s to make social change. For example, we're the group that ran the campaign to get the UCs to commit to 100% clean electricity, which is a huge victory in the fight against climate change. We've also banned plastic bags in California to protect the oceans, and we helped 10,000 students register to vote for the 2020 election. We're effective at what we do because we have 30,000 UC student members who pledged a $10 CalPERG activities fee to support us and give students a voice in politics. So this term, we're working to tackle the climate crisis. We're the first generation feeling the impacts of climate change, and we're the last ones that can do something about it. This past year alone, California experienced record-breaking temperatures and wildfires. Over 4 million acres burned, and thousands of people were displaced from their homes, while our whole state breathed toxic air. We've even had to evacuate the campus here. So we need to stop our dependence on dirty fossil fuels and switch to 100% clean, renewable energy. We've made a lot of really great progress. In 2018, CalPERG worked to help pass the bill that commits California to 100% renewable energy by 2045. But if the past year tells us anything, it's that we can't wait any longer to reduce our emissions. We need to speed up our transition to 100% clean electricity, and we're calling on Governor Newsom to make that a reality. So we're going to build a diverse coalition here on campus lobby our elected officials, and host a statewide clean energy summit in April to call for change. If that sounds like something you want to help out with, you should sign our petition and volunteer and internship opportunities are available at the end. But yeah, in case someone missed it, let me post the link again in the chat, and I'll give everyone a moment to click on it. Um, but yeah, let me know with a thumbs up or something. Can anybody, can everyone access that? I see yes in the chat. Okay, cool. Yeah, so great. Everyone here should sign our petition right now, even if you can't volunteer, so we can show UCSC students care. And I'll pause for a few seconds so you can sign as well. But yeah, well, while you fill that out, I'll also tell you a little bit more on what it's like to get involved if you're interested. So in addition to our climate change campaign, we're also working to get Whole Foods to stop using single-use plastic. We're trying to fight student hunger. And we're also working to make textbooks more affordable. If you want to get involved, you should check the boxes that say internship or volunteering. If you're looking for leadership, 
the best way to get involved is through our remote internship program. It's a great way to learn new skills, build your resume, and make a difference. And if you don't have time for an internship, that's totally okay. There are lots of ways to get volunteer. You'll have a lot of fun, you'll make a big difference, and it's a great way to get involved in campus org and stay connected with students at school. But yeah, that's pretty much everything. Thank you for having me. I look forward to working with you all this year. Okay, thank you. And now, back to Hobbes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, although, uh, unless are, unless there are any questions about any about assignments or the course or anything like that before I start. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I still have not put up official office hours. I think they're going to be. Uh, I think they're going to be late Monday morning and early Tuesday afternoon. Um, yeah. Uh, like maybe Monday at 11 and Tuesday at 2. I'll put, but I'll actually put that up when I get it. This week has been crazy. Um, but, um, but you know, if you can't make whatever time I put up, you can always uh, let me know, and we can find another time to meet. Um, Zoom makes that really easy, actually. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, so I wanted to start by talking about some of the stuff that got left over at the end last time. Uh, even though the stuff for today is really important and central as well. But um, so first of all, there's kind of a general point about the laws of nature. Um, let me write this up again, the laws of nature. And Bob says they bind in foro oops, interno in the internal forum or the internal court maybe you could translate this as so I mean this is a traditional term for talking about um, um, laws that a question of whether laws bind your actions or whether they bind your desires or um, intentions. Um, but uh, it turns out in Hobbes to mean something a little strange and kind of counterintuitive. So um, this he explains this on page... This is page 99, um, and it's chapter 15, paragraph 36. There we go. Oops. The laws of nature oblige in foro interno. That is to say, they bind to a desire they should take place. But in foro externo, that is, to the putting them in act, not always. Um, so what this means is, um, you remember what a desire is, according to Hobbes. A desire is a small motion inside of me that um, could cause a motion of my limbs, right? It could be the beginning of a process that would take that tiny, non-noticeable motion inside my brain, presumably, um, and amplify it until the point where my, you know, my limbs actually move. 
So when we say the laws of nature bind in foro interno, it means um, that, well, it means that they advise or counsel me to desire something. And what that means is that if I'm reasonable, um, because again, the laws of nature are the, the articles of peace suggested by reason, right? So if I'm reasonable, um, then when I hear the explanation uh, for the laws of nature, this small motion will occur inside me. <laughs> um, but what it means to say, so that's what it means to say they bind in foro interno. They, they bind means, you know, they actually will constrain a certain motion to happen. If I'm reasonable, the laws of nature will cause this small motion in my brain, which constitutes wishing that these laws would take place. That is, that they would be observed by everyone. Um, but they don't bind in foro externo. And what that means is that, um, well, so in language of like rights and, and laws and counsel and whatever, it means they counsel, they, they don't counsel or advise me to actually do anything. Not in the state of nature. Um, and um, why is that? So, so, uh, all right, so turning it into back into the language of what Hobbes thinks is really going on, it means that in a state of nature, although this small motion will happen, it won't get amplified into a motion of my limbs. So I'll wish that the laws of nature were observed, but I won't do anything about it. Why not? Well, um, in general, there's nothing I can do in a state of nature to make them, as an individual, to make these laws take place. And um, in the continuation of that paragraph, so I won't read the rest of it, but what Hobbes basically says is, you know, suppose I decide in the state of nature to start um, keeping all my compacts, to, to do everything that I promise. Um, well, no one else is going to do that, or at least I have no re I have no reason to think that everyone else is going to do that. There's no reliable, there's no guarantee that other people will do that. And so by keeping my promises while they don't keep theirs, um, I don't bring about a state where everyone keeps their promises. But I do get myself taken advantage of and in the state of nature being miserable as it is, probably killed, <laughs> right? Like it will tend to my own destruction. So um, that is just observing the laws of nature unilaterally is not a way to, to realize this wish. Um, and in general, again, as an individual in the state of nature, there's no action I can do that will realize this wish. So it's not even exactly that this wish, as sometimes happens, is like counteracted by other stronger wishes. It's that, you know, the means for it to be translated into action are blocked, basically. At least that's the way I understand what he's saying. So... Um, So this is something that's really important to remember when you when you think about the laws of nature, according to Hobbes, that according to, to Hobbes, the laws of nature are always universally binding everywhere. But that what that means is that they always cause this wish that they be observed everywhere. That that's what that's what they really command or counsel. It doesn't mean that um, you should or will reasonably obey them in the state of nature. You, you won't if you're reasonable. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, before I leave this, I guess I should say that one question to pay attention to the future, however, is, and I guess it's it's always, I think, I've come to realize more and more about Hobbes, it's always important to think about, he always focuses on a certain specific case, which is the law of, the individuals in the law of nature forming a, const, a commonwealth by institution. But there's all these other like weird cases and you have to, have to try to figure out how well these things apply to those. And one question is about sovereigns who are always in a state of nature, both with respect to each other and for reasons I hope I'm going to get to soon, also with respect to their subjects. So the, the sovereign person, whether it's an individual or an assembly, is as such not a subject of any commonwealth. It's in the state of nature, but it's not clear whether these things uh, that I just said apply to that kind of state of nature. And it may be important that they don't, right? That is, it may be important that um, a sovereign does have a reason to obey the law of nature with respect to their subjects. even though they remain in a state of nature with respect to their subjects. Okay, um, are there questions about that? I, I mean, I'm emphasizing this partly, again, this is one of the things I made a note to myself that people were confused about last time when they answered a question about it. So are there, are there questions about this thing about in foro interno versus in foro externo? a little bit more about what you mean when sovereigns are in a state of nature with their subjects. Because I understand what you're saying when they're in a state of nature between sovereigns, but not necessarily when you say within their own subjects. Well, right. So, I mean, well, like I said, I mean, that's coming up when we describe the nature of the, of the, the, um, uh, compact or covenant that forms the commonwealth. But basically, according to Hobbes, it's, um, it's not a compact or, co co or covenant between the subjects and the sovereign. It's a compact or covenant between the subjects to jointly authorize the sovereign. So um, it binds the subjects, but it doesn't bind the sovereign. So the sovereign remains in the state of nature. He doesn't say that straight out in this reading, but he does say that in black and white later. And in this, the reading for today, he already explains the reason for it. Um, and again, I got, I hope I'll get a chance to talk about that more later. In the, but does that help? Whoever asked that? It's, yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm having a don't necessarily see someone when they ask a question. I don't know why. Um, all right. Anyway. Um, okay, so beyond that, the other thing I wanted to say was about the third law and how it's related to the first law and the second law. Um, so remember, the, the first law just states the motive for all the other laws. That is, the reason I should desire to see the other laws obeyed is that I should desire peace. And I should desire peace because the state of nature is miserable. Um, so, so that was the first law, seek peace. But then um, the second law is, well, how could there be peace as long as everyone has an unlimited right to everything? And Hobbes' answer is there couldn't, right? So the second law is that I should desire um, the mutual laying down of rights. Right? I should desire the mutual laying down of rights. Again, that I would lay down my rights and no one else would. There's no reason I should desire that. That would be very unreasonable for me to desire. <laughs> right? Because uh, remember, I desire, you know, 
what I desire is pleasure a little bit, but mostly power for myself <laughs> and my own self-preservation, I guess. Right? So I don't desire that I will lay down my rights and no one else will, but I do desire that uh, um, there could be a way for me to lay down some of my rights and everyone else lay down the same rights. Or I will if I'm reasonable, and that's the second law. So the third, so um, this mutual laying down of rights, I'm going to um, say more about the technical definition of covenant or compact in a second, but this mutual laying down of rights is, you know, by definition, an example of what Hobbes calls a covenant or compact. So what I desire, or what I what I desire, if I'm reasonable, is that there should be a certain kind of covenant or compact between me and all the other people around here. It's a little bit unclear whether why, or maybe I should really desire that it would not just be between me and people around here, but between people everywhere, like all people. Um, um, but. I mean, Hobbes does ha say something in answer to that, I guess, which is that if the state gets big enough, or the Commonwealth gets big enough, that um, adding or subtracting a few people here and there won't make it clear whether uh, its enemies can beat it or not, then uh, you basically there's no reason to keep going from there. You're already as safe as you could be. So I think that's why he thinks that we, you know, we can be satisfied with the continuation of commonwealths that, that engage in war against each other. I think he thinks that. I'm not sure. Maybe he really thinks we should wish for one commonwealth to conquer the earth. He doesn't say that. Um, so... Um, um, well, actually, I was going to talk about this now, about the definition of contract so, and compact. So let me talk about it now, to that part of my notes. Um, so the definition of contract in Chapter 14, Section 9, on page 82... The mutual transferring of right is that which men call contract. So that's the definition of contract. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to read this part. Um, he defines, uh, so this is definitely a contract, as I said, by definition. It's a mutual laying, transferring or laying down of rights. Um, but in particular, it's the type of contract that he calls a covenant or compact. I, I don't know why he always keeps up this, or sometimes he calls it a pact. Uh, I don't know why one word for it isn't enough. Usually he calls it a covenant. Um, so a covenant is a contract where um, the right is transferred before the good that it's a right to. So at least in the case of like buying and selling, it's it's easy to understand what a covenant is like, right? So like uh, Hobbes says, you know, purchasing with ready money, that is like with cash on hand, is, is an example of a contract according to him, but it's not an example of, of a covenant because at the same time as... Um, you give me the right to your money and I give you the right to whatever I'm selling. You also give me your money and I give you what I'm selling. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, with that kind of contract, there's no question of like, why should you keep it or something? Right? I mean, obviously you should hand over the money because otherwise you won't get the thing. They're, they're like, 
it's, you have to exchange them, <laughs> right? But a covenant happens when at least one of the parties is not doing it that way. So, for example, if you buy something on credit, so, you know, you give the... Um, at the at the time you purchase the thing, you give the seller the right to demand a certain amount of money for you from you, but you don't give them the money yet. Well, someone asked, "The right is transferred before the good of what?" Did that? Did what I just say help ex answer that? In the case of buying and selling, the the good is the thing is well, the goods that are being transferred are the money and the thing that's being sold right it's i mean it's goods in a perfectly normal like commercial sense basically <laughs> right not some mysterious philosophical sense at, at least well i don't know i guess we don't usually call money goods but you know like are the goods delivered you know like the goods might be potatoes are the potatoes delivered at the same time that you get the rights to the potatoes or do I say now, okay, give me the money and you will, you know, have the right to my potatoes, which I'm going to have delivered to you tomorrow. All right. So, um, so in, if, if that happens, then at least from the point of view of the person who is not delivering the right along with the goods, because it, right, it could be, as in the case I just mentioned, that one person is delivering the money right now, but the other person is not delivering the potatoes till tomorrow. So, you know, the person, from the point of view of the person who is giving the money, this is just a regular contract, but from the point of view of the person who's supposed to deliver the potatoes, it's an example of a covenant or a compact. Now, um, this contract that I wish would take place because it would bring peace um, is an example of a covenant in both, obviously in both directions because it's completely symmetrical, right? It's mutual laying down of rights. Why is it an example of a covenant? Well, the rights are transferred immediately, but the goods have to keep being delivered forever, basically. Right, because the right I I transfer to you is um, 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 like every time a situation comes up where our unlimited natural rights would conflict with each other, um, one of us has to deliver to the other the good of, and now it is a little bit abstract and mysterious and philosophical. It's not a, a sack of potatoes, but it's the good of me not interfering with you exercising your right of nature. Right? So like we both, you know, we both see a potato. I like the cake example better than potatoes, but anyway, whatever. <laughs> we, we both see a potato. We both want the potato. Um, uh, but it's your potato and not mine. That is somehow either directly or as a result of this mutual laying down of rights. Your original, right? Originally, we both had the right to the potato and everything else in the world. So, but somehow as a, as a, a, a consequence of this, you've laid down your right to this potato, that's part of what makes it mine, right? If you and everyone else lay down their right to the potato, it becomes my potato. That's the origin of property, right? So, but every time that situation happens, I have to depend on you to actually not take my potato. So the goods keep getting delivered over and over again, even though the right was all delivered at the beginning. So someone says, so the covenant is only referring to the person that has yet to transfer their right after another has already transferred theirs. No, I think, so for it to be a contract at all, the rights have to be transferred, have to be exchanged simultaneously, right? Otherwise, it's not a contract. So like if I give you my potato, um, 
because you say or I hope that you're going to give me something tomorrow. Right? There's a whole technical civil law discussion in, in Hobbes about this, about the different ways of, con of conveying ownership, right? Like if I say, I will give you this tomorrow, versus if I say, I give it to you now to be delivered tomorrow. Right, so the, the the second one is an example of something that could be part of a contract. I'm now giving you the right, which binds me to give you the potato tomorrow. But if I don't give you the right now, that means I still have the right and I can decide not to give you the potato tomorrow. Right, so that's an example. If I give you if I give you money, if you say, I'm gonna give you a potato tomorrow. And I say, oh, okay, here's some money. Then um, uh, that money was a free gift because you didn't transfer the right to the potato to me yet. So every contract involves the immediate mutual exchange of rights. And if there isn't, then it's an exchange of gifts, not a contract. Right, but um, what? But not every contract involves the immediate ex um, exchange of the goods to which the rights are being given. Right, so that's the case of where I say, um, okay. There's another question. Uh, let me finish what I'm saying first, and then I'll answer this. Right, so. So um, that's the case where I say, um, if you pay me, um, if you pay me now, I will give you a potato to be delivered tomorrow. <laughs> right. So if I say that, then at the same time you gave me the money and therefore the right to the money also, right? Uh, I mean, you didn't give it to me as a deposit or whatever. You gave it to me to be mine. So at the same time you gave me the money and the right to the money, I gave you the right to the potato. Um, so the rights have been exchanged completely now. Meaning that if I decide not to deliver the potato to you tomorrow, I have injured you. That is, I have done an injustice to you. I've broken my covenant. Um, so the, I don't know if that helped, but let me, maybe if I address this other question, that will also help. Is the covenant tied to the person who delivers and the contract is tied to the person who is buying? Well, the, okay, so a covenant is a kind of contract. It's not like there's a contract and then there's a covenant. A covenant is a type of contract. It's a contract in which the goods are not delivered immediately. Um, which goods are not delivered immediately depends on what covenant we make. Right, so going back to the potato example, I could say, um, you know, uh, um, in exchange for your potato now, uh, I'll give you the right to my money to be delivered tomorrow. Right, that's basically what we do when we buy something on credit. Right, we say, Professor, yeah. Sorry to you off, but so you're saying that a covenant is a type of contract that is like an understanding for the future versus a contract is like an immediate immediacy, like you're receiving the item in that moment? Well, okay, so again, a covenant is, is, is a type of contract, right? So the big circle is all contracts. And within that, there's a little circle of covenants, right? And I know this isn't readable. Believe me, it's supposed to say covenants, right? So within the big circle, which is all contracts, there's a little circle, which is the covenants. And the difference between covenants and other contracts is that other contracts, yeah, everything is finished at the same time. But covenants are contracts where um, something remains to be delivered. The thing that remains to be delivered can't be the right. The right has to go immediately because, again, if the right hasn't gone, then I can still change my mind tomorrow. I haven't really contracted to do anything. 
Okay, if so if the right is immediate, then that means that... Wait, I just lost what I was going to say, so never mind. No, just say, right, so everywhere in the big circle, the rights are immediately transferred, exchanged, right? But in the little circle, the thing that I've given you a right to isn't yet in your possession, right? So, uh, um, again, it's easier to understand with the potatoes, right? Like, you know, you have the right to potatoes, but you don't have the potatoes yet. So if I don't give you the potatoes you know, how are you going to get them? Well, you need a way of enforcing your right. Um, whereas if I, if we had just exchanged money in potatoes, the business will be done, right? You wouldn't need a way of enforcing your right to the potatoes. You already have them. So what I'm saying is this mutual laying down of rights that's supposed to bring us out of the state of nature um, into a state of peace um, necessarily falls within this little circle because we never finish this business, right? Everything that I'm supposed to do so as not to be at war with you in the indefinite future is part of what I've delivered the right to you immediately. So it's like, you know, in other words, I'm saying like, Tomorrow I'm going to deliver to you not taking your stuff, not killing you, etc., etc. And the next day I'm going to deliver it to you, not taking your stuff, not killing you, etc., etc., and so on. So wouldn't the business finish as soon as the goods are delivered, right? But I'm saying these goods are never finished being delivered. I mean, it's kind of like I said... Pay me some money now, and I will, you know, transfer you the right to a lifetime supply of potatoes. <laughs> right? That would never be finished. You would always forever, you know, at least for the rest of your life, have to rely on me to keep making actual the right that I gave to you at the beginning by supplying you potatoes every day. And what I'm saying is this this laying down of, of our infinite, unlimited right in the state of nature that puts us in a state of war, it's, it's something we have to keep doing every day. Right? Every, in the state of nature, every time I saw something of yours that I wanted, I would, tr I would fight to take it if I thought it was worth the trouble or anyway. Right. So in this state of peace we're in now, I have to every time say to myself, no, I don't have that right. Okay, I just want to clarify because yeah. I'm getting confused. Okay. So you're saying that a contract is a right between two people that are immediately transferred. And that is the case in a covenant, but the goods that the right that was transferred still need to be delivered. Yes. So in that case, if you're at like a store yeah. and you're buying something, um, would that technically be a contract because the two, like when you give someone your money at the cash register, you take, you take the potatoes that you're buying, let's say, and it's an immediate transfer. You're not waiting yeah, so that's an example of a contract that's not a covenant. And that's an example that Hobbes actually gives. Buying with ready money is what he calls it, right? So that's an example of a contract that's not a covenant because there's no unfinished business. The thing, I've, I gave you the right to the potatoes, and at the same exact time you took the potatoes, and I don't have them anymore. Um, now, I mean... Uh, the fact that I don't come back tomorrow and take things that you own is not part of that contract, but it is part of this, <laughs> right? That business isn't finished. If it weren't for this, I could sell you the potatoes today and tomorrow say, you know, I'd like those potatoes back and go over to your house and fight you for them. <laughs> and, I would, and I would have every right to do that. That's why we would be in the state of war. And that, of course, is why no one would buy or sell potatoes in that state. And we would all, we wouldn't have civilization in that state. 
right? Um, so, uh, but uh, assuming this is in place, then once I've given you the potatoes, our business is done. You, you possess them and you own them and we're finished. Um, As someone says, so it's about more than length of time because with contracts there's an immediate exchange of rights, whereas a covenant is an in eternally ongoing contract. Well, no, with most covenants, the covenant, you know, ends after a certain amount of time, right? Like if the covenant, again, is if you pay me now for potatoes I'm going to deliver tomorrow, once I, p I pay you, once I bring you the potatoes, the covenant is fulfilled and there's nothing left to do. But that's what, but I, what I keep emphasizing is that this one is never fulfilled. Do people understand what I mean when I point against saying this one? Like the yes. yeah, the the mutual laying down of our unlimited rights that will allow us to leave the state of war and be in a state of peace. Okay. Um, well, I spent longer on that than I planned to, but it's super important, so maybe it's a good thing if people are confused about it. Um, the only other remark I want to make about this before going on to the third law is to again mention um, that, um, as I did last time, as far as seeking peace, there is another way to do it besides this mutual laying down of rights. Namely, if one person is, is strong enough to force everyone else to stop fighting each other and stop fighting with them, they can get peace that way also. Now, I mean, again, in the state of nature, the way in, I don't know what to call this, but like the original state of nature, the, the natural state of nature, the individualistic state of nature, right? The one where we're thinking about quote unquote savages, right? Individuals or possibly families, but um, um, who are, uh, you know, just each at war with all the others the strategy of me imposing peace on everyone else is not going to work because I'm not strong enough to do that. Uh, right, and that gets back to the idea that all humans have equal power in the state of nature or equal enough that it's not reasonable to gamble with it, right? So in, the state, in that original or individual state of nature, again, it's not reasonable to, for to do anything. In particular, it's not reasonable for me to go out and try to force everyone else to be at peace. But um, assuming, and though, I mean, Hobbes doesn't put this condition on it, but I think there has to be this condition on what he calls commonwealth by acquisition, which is that assuming there already is a commonwealth somewhere, so there already is an artificial person who's much more powerful than any individual, right? A Leviathan. <laughs> so, you know, um, this artificial person can definitely impose peace, or at least in some situations, may be able to impose peace on its surroundings by conquering them. And again, that's what Hobbes calls commonwealth by acquisition. And he kind of mentions it to begin with, but then kind of lets you forget about it because he, he talks a lot about commonwealth by, by institution, which is, the, which is this mutual laying down of rights. And then only after that is a chapter where he shows that the rights of the sovereign by acquisition are exactly the same as the rights of the sovereign by institution. And so, you know, just apply everything I said, right? Well, but I mean, the way this is set up is actually quite different. It's not, this is a symmetrical com compact between everyone who's going to be in the Commonwealth, whereas um, the Commonwealth by acquisition, Hobbes says, um, this is in chapter 21 on page 141. What am I doing for time? I guess I will read this in the book. So, I mean, we haven't got to this yet, but 
um, since I since I know it's coming, <laughs> I can read it. On page 141, chapter 21, section 11. Um, is that, why is it doing this? There we go. Sovereignty by institution is by covenant of everyone to everyone. And sovereignty by acquisition, by covenants of the vanquished to the victor, or child to the parent. That has to do with his idea of how uh, families can become little commonwealths or whatever, um, which we'll see more about later. But... Um, um, so the commonwealth by acquisition, or sovereignty by acquisition, which is the same thing, is that rather than being this mutual uh, covenant between everyone and everyone else, it's like a series of covenants between the, the conqueror and each individual they conquer. But um, actually, maybe I shouldn't have drawn these arrows here because unlike this, it's not a mutual laying down of rights. It's not symmetrical. So the way it works is that, um, it, again, like imagining this happens between individuals, although normally it doesn't, I think. Except, again, maybe except in the context of a family or something. But imagining this happens between individuals. So the way it happens is I conquer a bunch of people. What does it mean that I conquer them? It means I have it in my power to kill them. They can't resist. I've got them. But then instead of killing them, I say... Um, I'll deliver your life now if you promise to obey me in the future. <laughs> That's the contract. So you can see that that contract is only a covenant in one direction. Right? The conqueror delivers the goods right away. I'm not going to kill you right now. They're not promising they'll never kill you. A sovereign can't make a promise like that. Right? They have to be able to kill people if it's for the needs of the commonwealth. <laughs> so they're not promising I'll never kill you. They're saying, I could kill you right now, but I won't if you promise to be my subject in the future. That's how the commonwealth by acquisition works. Um, and, you know, I guess there's one other case to bring up here, which is also commonwealth by acquisition, or at least works by acquisition, which is not a weird special case at all. In a sense, it's the usual case, which is suppose you're born into a commonwealth that already exists. What makes you a subject of it? You never made a covenant with all these people to lay down your unlimited right of nature. Um, you know, I mean, you can't when you're just born, right? You're like not able to do stuff like that when you're just born. Um, so um, uh, what makes you a subject? So we'll see actually that Locke says you're not a subject until you reach the age of reason, at which point you can become a subject if you want. But this is really like he has his work cut out for for him explaining why we don't notice this most of the time, right? Like people who are born in an existing state are not usually given a choice of whether they want to be a subject of it or not. So Locke has has a hard time explaining that. He, I mean, he has an explanation, but for Hobbes, it's easy to explain. The infant is born, right away, they're conquered. Right? This, this is the, the commonwealth they're born into has it in their power to destroy them as soon as they're born. They're helpless. At that point, they're already involved in the covenant. And, but it's this kind of covenant. 
right? So, and the reason I say, in a way, this isn't a strange case, it's the normal case, is because, of course, after the first generation, everyone has become a subject this way. It's only the first formation of a covenant in that original or individual state of nature that actually happens by mutual laying down of rights. I think that's everything I just said is true. Hobbes doesn't, at least doesn't go out of his way to explain it. Um, and it's worth, you know, thinking about why, you know, why he, there's, uh, there's various possible explanations and I'm not sure which one is right or maybe it's a combination of them, but anyway, why he emphasizes so much the Commonwealth by institution, which happens by a mutual laying down of rights, even though if you look into it further, you'll see that that's basically not normally how people become parties to, uh, you know, enter the state of peace, enter the civil state. Okay, are there questions about that before I go on? Okay, so let me just quickly then write, I mean, in a sense, the third law, therefore, is easy to understand from this point of view. What I should desire, so I should desire that there be a state of peace. Therefore, I should desire that there be a mutual laying down of rights. Therefore, I should desire that mutual laying down of rights will work. <laughs> That is, that the goods will actually be delivered. Um, so the third law of nature is, as he puts that, that men should keep their covenants. And um, I mean, I guess it's worth noticing that even though the second law doesn't really apply to the case of commonwealth by acquisition, Right. I mean, in the case of commonwealth by acquisition, reason is not is is really suggesting articles of surrender, not articles of peace. Right. However, from the third law on, they're still going to be the same. I think. Right. And um, well, maybe that's even a weird way of putting it. After all, the laws of nature themselves, you know, they're not in any commonwealth. They're just things that I should desire happen. So I guess, but I'll put it this way. You know, this one, it's not clear that I have to desire this in order to seek peace, because I could instead desire that someone would conquer everyone and force us to all be at peace. But this one, I'm still going to have to desire either way, right? Because the Commonwealth by acquisition also works by covenant. You know, so if the, if the, if the victor says to the vanquished, okay, I'll let you live on the condition that you promised to, um, you know, be my subject after this, um, that will only work if they actually do um, keep their end of the bargain and don't like, as soon as they're no longer under the gun, you know, say, oh, well, yeah, I, I said you, I'd be your subject then, but I'm not now, bye, <laughs> right? So, um, right, so, so, and I think from the, so I think, and I think it's important from the third law on, there are all things that you sh ought reasonably to desire, even if you're not desiring peace to come about by, by those means. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to say about the laws of nature. Now I have some small, I mean, not that small, but not enough time left to talk about the new reading. Um, uh, but right, I'll be right here. So, so the new reading is um, um, obviously about what's obviously the most important question of the book. Um, okay, so. What is the covenant and how does how could it come about? What is the covenant that will that will actually bring us out of the state of nature into the civil state? Right? The state of nature as opposed to the civil state.
This again is that word, right? Civitas is the equivalent of polis. So you're basically calling this the political state, or you could say the state of commonwealth, because again, that's another equivalent to polis. So that's what Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and Wollstonecraft, if she mentions this, I don't remember she does, but anyway, that's what they mean by the civil state as opposed to the state of nature. So I was focused on. I don't know how to get my camera to refocus other than by unplugging it and plugging it back in. All right. There's probably a better way, but I don't know. Um, but that is what is going to save us from the robot apocalypse, actually. You realize that. You know, when the AI, evil AI, try to take over the world, they're going to get stuck and they're going to be like, hey, uh, could you turn me off and turn me back on again, please? <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so, um, right, so how is this civil state, which will be a state of peace, unlike the state of war, that is the state of nature? I hope it's not too confusing the way I'm using the word state, right? Like state in one sense of the English word state is is now at least as an equivalent for Hobbes's world word commonwealth, right? As you think about, you know, the state of Indonesia or, the, you know, the state of Russia or, you know, whatever, right? Um, uh, of course, what we call states in the United States are not sovereign, so they're not really states or commonwealths, right? Like the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is not really a commonwealth. But anyway, um, but that's one, you know, but here I'm using the term state to mean, you know, like this water is in a liquid state, right? The state of nature. I mean, I think that's clear enough, but... Um, um, okay, well, in case it's not, I hope that helped clear it up. So, okay, so in any case, what is the covenant? And the covenant is stated in chapter 17. On, although when you first read it, it's not clear why it's a covenant. So I'm going to have to talk about that. But it's stated in chapter 17, paragraph 13 on page 109. Um, oops. I don't know why this keeps happening either. Maybe it's because this. Mm -hmm. I don't know why there's so much glare on my book today. Okay. but it's this italicized passage up here. Oh my. Maybe I should just read it, not. Okay, here it is. It's as if every man should say to every man, I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or this assembly of men, on this condition, that thou give, well, actually this formulation, it is clear that it's a covenant. Is this what I was gonna read? Oh no, I was gonna read this up here.
This is the agreement they make, to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly of men that may reduce all their wills by plurality of voices unto one will, which is as much as to say, to appoint one man or assembly of men to bear their person, and every one to own and acknowledge himself to be author of whatsoever be that he that he that so beareth their person shall act. Right? So the agreement is, I mean, I'm sorry that was that was very sorry, that was a very confusing and disorganized way to read that passage. All right. But the agreement is the mutual laying down of or sorry, the agreement is that um, um, is not like if I don't take your potatoes, you don't take my potatoes or something like that. The agreement is um, that we all agree to appoint one human being or assembly of human beings to bear our person. Now, what is a person? So in the interest of time, I'm not going to get too much into detail on this, but this is the, the subject of chapter 16. So chapter 16 is actually still in book one, but I assigned it for today because it's, I think its main importance is to understanding this thing he, he says in chapter 17 when he explains what the covenant actually is. So chapter 16 is all about what, what the word person means. And basically, um, so Hobbes says that person means the same as actor. And he has a long explanation based on the, what the Latin word originally meant and so forth, which like most of his etymologies, I'm not sure is really accurate. But in any case, he's saying person means the same thing as actor. But what he means by actor is more than what we mean by actor. <laughs> so it means both what we would call an actor in the sense of like someone pretending to be someone else on the stage. Um, but it also means what we would call an agent. Agent is just a Latin way of saying, well, actually, actor is also Latin. But yeah, and these are just two Latin words of saying someone who does something, basically, <laughs> right? So like, um, um, but we don't use them interchangeably. So an agent, and in both in the sense of agent, in which an agent just means someone who acts, someone who does things, like a free agent, and. For these purposes, more importantly, agent in the sense of, I make you my agent. Right? So when, we, when, when I say, when we say that we're authorizing someone to bear our person, what it means basically is that we're appointing that person as our agent to act in our behalf, on our behalf. Now, I mean, in the larger sense of person that Hobbes describes in chapter 16, you know, you can be a person or personate someone without authorization, right? So, like, the actor on stage just pretends to be someone. They're, they're doing it kind of legitimately, but also what falls under this is that if I come to you and say, I'm acting on behalf of so-and-so, but I'm really not... I'm still a, I'm still personating them, uh, but uh, I'm not authorized. Um, so I mean, in that case, we wouldn't use the word agent. I mean, I guess we might use the word actor. I don't know, but it. Uh, but in any case, the 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 case that's important for us, which is the case that's going to make the Commonwealth happen, is the case where the person is authorized. Where the person is authorized, that means that um, they had, didn't just decide to start acting as if they were acting for me, but that I have made them 
my person. I've given the right to bear my person, to act for me. And again, like the word we would use that for that in English now is agent, right? So I've made them my agent. Um, so the thing that forms the commonwealth, the agreement that forms the commonwealth now, is that um, a multitude, and again, this is a commonwealth by institution, of course, a multitude all agree together that a single person is going to be a single, oh boy, this is confusing. A single person is going to bear their person as well. I guess is the right way to put it, right? A single person in the sense of, I guess it's to say like, Someone who acts versus someone who acts for someone else. Right? The English word agent now means both of those. Like I said, when you call someone a free agent, you mean that they're a free actor. They act on their own behalf. But on the other hand, when you say so-and-so is my agent, you mean they act on your behalf, right? So um, both, again, both of these are examples of persons, according to Hobbes. So that's why, like, you can call every human being a natural person, because they all act on their own behalf. Um, you can also call an assembly that decides by majority a person, because it has a way of acting. Someone said, like a representative. Yes, it is. It's representative, I think, in this sense of representative is, um, is equivalent to person or agent, right? Um, um, the way they're representing me is by acting in my behalf. That's what makes them my representative. Um, so... Um, Um, so what happens in the formation of the commonwealth is that we take some, ex some person, either an individual human being or an assembly of human beings that's going to act by majority, and we, make, we give that person the right to bear our person, to be our agent. So the only difference between an actor and an agent is that an agent has authorization to act on someone's behalf. Yeah, I mean, but but please remember that that Hobbes Hobbes doesn't use this word agent, right? I don't think that English in his time made the distinction that we make between actor and agent. So he uses actor for all of this. So so Hobbes doesn't have a special word for an authorized person. He just has to say an authorized person. Someone who's authorized to bear someone else's person. Okay, so, um, so I mean, by, by introducing our term agent, I'm, I know I'm risking confusion because it's not Hobbes' terminology. On the other hand, I think it really helps to understand what he's talking about. Because if you say, I'm appointing someone to bear my person, like, I don't think any of you would have a good idea what that means, right? Um, but if you say I'm appointing someone my agent or representative, then that uh, we understand what that means, right? So, and that's what it means to authorize someone to bear my person. So the the people who are going to be the subjects of the Commonwealth, what they have to do is agree um, that someone or some assembly is going to be their authorized representative. Hobbes, Hobbes does use the term representative for this. Going to be their authorized representative or agent. Going to act, going to be authorized to act on their behalf. So, um, Uh, 
Um, why is this a covenant? Why is it a mutual covenant between all of us? Right? I mean, it sounds like an arrangement each of us is making with this entity that's going to bear our person. It doesn't sound like a mutual agreement between all of us. Um, um, of course, it is a kind of, and so, by the way, in case this isn't obvious, the entity that bears our person is the sovereign. Right, so before the covenant, there's a scattered multitude in a state of war with respect to each other, but they leave the state of war with respect to each other by agreeing to all appoint someone to act on their behalf, the same person. I don't know, maybe that's not the answer. <laughs> and the person that they, that they authorize to act on their behalf is the sovereign. So the sovereign could be, and this is confusing, but it's a key example that Hobbes keeps using for various purposes. The sovereign could be everyone regarded as an assembly that decides by majority. In that case, the commonwealth they formed is a, is a democracy. The sovereign could be a group of people that they've selected or agreed how to select. Or the sovereign could be an individual. That would be an oligarch. Uh, actually, usually he calls it um, uh, aristocracy. That would be an aristocracy. Or the sovereign could be an individual, and then it's a monarchy. But so, again, so there, there is an arrangement between each subject and the sovereign, but that arrangement is not a covenant. So that arrangement is an arrangement of appointing to agency or something like that. Um, the, um, the covenant is... Um, Um, everyone is going to give up a certain right. By authorizing an agent, I give up a right. And the right I give up is the right to... Um, contest their decision as to my will. So, Ray, the agent, you know, the agent will deliberate on my behalf, will entertain a series of desires and aversions on my behalf, and they'll end up with one. And that's their, the one they end up with is the will on my behalf. And now here I am, I have desires and aversions in real life, right, going on in my brain. In the state of nature, um, no matter what I told this person, you're going to be my agent or whatever, I have the right, when I finish my deliberations, to do the last thing, right, that is to have my own will, which contradicts the will of the agent. Therefore, in the state of nature, uh, making someone your agent is normally doesn't do much good. To, but so to really make someone your agent, you have to lay down that right. So I have to say what your final desire on my behalf um, is going to count as my will, and therefore. I won't act in contradiction to it any more than I would act in contradiction to my own actual will. That's the right I'm giving up. Right, so maybe like a concrete example would help, you know, like if I say, if I make you my agent, now in general you don't make someone your agent with unlimited powers. Right, in general you make someone your agent for something, right, so I say, I authorize you to buy potatoes on my behalf. 
with that authorization, you go to the store and say, and I mean, let's say to make it especially clear that I'm authorizing you to buy potatoes on credit on my behalf. So you go to the store and you say to the shopkeeper, um, um, if you give me a bag of potatoes for Abe, I guarantee on his behalf, that is, on his behalf, I transfer you to the to you the right of certain amount of money to be delivered tomorrow. A certain amount of his money, right? That is a certain amount of Abe's money. So you you so now the shopkeeper gives you the potatoes and you give them to me. At that point, I no longer have the right to say, no, I didn't want these potatoes afterwards. I'm not paying for them. I've laid down that right. And so notice the right I've laid down is not a right with respect to the agent. It's respect to the, to the shopkeeper. Right? In the state of nature, I would have an unlimited right to say, no, I'm keeping your potatoes and the money. <laughs> Um, but, uh, if I've effectively made you my agent to buy potatoes, I've laid down that right that I would have against the shopkeeper to keep the money. I have to give it to the shopkeeper now. So that's the kind of right that we're mutually laying down. It's not directly a right to things like potatoes. It's a right to second guess the sovereign's decisions. That's what we're laying down. Um, and, you know, because this is a mutual agreement between everyone, everyone who's going to make up this commonwealth has to be in on this first agreement. That is, it has to be by consensus, not by majority. There can be a second step, and maybe there always is a second step. This is a little ambiguous in Hobbes, but I'm going to emphasize this because these two steps turn up in Locke and Rousseau also. And Rousseau, in Rousseau, it's clear that they have to be two different steps. So the two steps are, first of all, that we all agree by consensus that we're going to appoint someone as the sovereign. By that act, we make ourselves into an assembly that can choose the sovereign by majority, basically. And even the form of government by, by majority, right? So we can all come together and say by consensus, okay, consensus is there's going to be one agent, one person who bar bears all of our persons. Um, and then we can vote to see who that's going to be, who or what. Um, now you might say, oh, so it's really a democracy, but that's the last time we get to vote, <laughs> right? Because once we've chosen the sovereign, um, the sovereign has the right to cast all our votes. That's one of the rights we, that's one of the powers we've given the sovereign as our agent to cast votes for us. So the next time there's a decision to be made, um, the sovereign doesn't have to ask all of us to vote on it. Because um, the sovereign can vote on all of our behalves. Of course, they won't actually vote, right? They'll just decide. <laughs> but, I saying, but, but, but so to speak, they're holding a vote and they're saying, oh, it was unanimous. <laughs> Right? Like, I asked everyone what their vote was, and I answered on their on everyone's behalf, my vote is this. <laughs> um, right, so again, there's a question, and this is a really good question, it's important. So is the covenant between the subjects to lay down their right to self-governance for a said individual? that is in favor of allowing this individual to govern them, 
or is it a covenant between the subject and the sovereign? And the answer is, again, in a, in a, in a commonwealth by institution, there is no covenant between the subjects and the sovereign. The covenant is only between the subjects. And the covenant, again, between the subjects is to stand behind what the, so what the sovereign does on this, their behalf. Now, I mean, why is this going to allow us to leave the state of war? Well, I mean, remember, we all should want peace if we're reasonable. So if the sovereign acts on our behalf and acts reasonably, the sovereign is going to want to act in such a way to bring about peace. But unlike each individual, who, each individual has nothing they can do to bring about this, to, to make this, to fulfill this desire for peace. The sovereign, um, because they're authorized to decide on everyone's behalf, can reach a decision like this. Whoever violates the peace, the rest of us will punish them. <laughs> and if that works, um, then the state of war is over. Right? So the sovereign, if reasonable, and if really acting on our behalf, is going to want all these laws of nature to come into effect. Um, and the sovereign, unlike us, can call on the whole power of the commonwealth to make sure that happens. And that's the way out of the, the state of nature, the state of war. Um, Now notice, this seems like it's kind of circular, if you think about it, right? Like remember, the third law of nature is that men should keep their covenants made. So now we're asking, what's going to put the third law of nature into effect? Well, it's this covenant we're making with each other. So because of this covenant, because we've all given up our rights to second-guess the sovereign, when the sovereign's says to us, um, okay, what I've decided is you should punish this person because they violated the, the laws of nature. For example, because they didn't keep their covenant, we're all going to say, oh, okay, my covenant doesn't allow me to second guess that. So I guess we're going to punish them and you go punish them. Um, but why? Why would this covenant I made, made me, make me do that? Because I made, when I made the covenant, I was still in the state of nature. And this is actually not just kind of a logical puzzle. It's like a practical question about sovereignty and commonwealths uh, of any kind. And maybe it helps maybe to understand why even a democracy that's an assembly of all the people has this problem, right? We all meet and vote by majority that we're going to punish so-and-so. Why should the people in the minority do that? Only because of their covenant. So, um, but I'm mean, saying it's actually a practical problem for any form of government, right? How come just because this person, this individual or assembly somewhere says to do something, how is that going to make anything happen? There's no actual chains. There's just these invisible artificial chains. But in a state of nature, they're supposed to be ineffective. And yet we formed this in the state of nature. Or to put it differently, who says we're not still in the state of nature? So I think the answer is that for every other covenant that we make after this, the reason we keep it is going to be fear of punishment by the sovereign. Punishment by the sovereign meaning by the sovereign calling, if necessary, on the entire force of the commonwealth. 
Um, but um, this first covenant, it is made out of fear, fear, you know, fear of violent death, right? Um, it is made out of fear, but it's not made of, out of fear of the sovereign, obviously, because there is no sovereign until after the covenant is made. But um, it's made out of fear of, or I guess I should say not it's made out of, but it's enforced by fear of returning to the state of nature if people get away with not following it. So, I mean, um, is that enough to get me to follow it? Well, not, not directly. Right? If it were enough directly, then we wouldn't need anything to get out of the state of nature because we, you know, in the state of nature already we're in fear of being in the state of nature, right? So it's not enough to get me to follow it directly, but it is enough to get me to punish someone else for not following it. And now that everyone has said that's the plan, um, that's enough to get any individual to think it's a bad bet to violate it. Well, any individual? No, of course. People rebel. People commit crimes. There are, really are civil wars. Commonwealths go out of existence, whatever. But it's reliable enough to get us out of the state of war. Right? Everyone now thinks, after everyone has expressed this mutual agreement to each other, everyone thinks, I would like to violate this covenant whenever it's an, you know, to my advantage. But I know that everyone else is going to be really freaked out when I do that. <laughs> They're going to be like, uh-oh, we're heading back to the state of nature. So it's going to be in everyone else's uh, interest to punish me. So I think that's what enforces this original covenant. And then, of course, once that original covenant is enforced, meaning, so, right, how would I violate the state of nature by having the sovereign decide that I should do something, but then not doing it? Right, so once that covenant has teeth, that means that other covenants I make, right, like I promise to pay you back for your potatoes or whatever, and all the other things that are, that are supposed to be protected by the laws of nature, plus the civil laws that the sovereign may make now, um, all of those things um, are um, enforced by fear of the sovereign because since I know that this original covenant is probably going to be kept, I know the sovereign can punish me if I um, go against my authorization of them. Um, I hope what I said wasn't just too comp just now wasn't too complicated to follow. So the most important thing to say about this reading, to try to explain, well, maybe not. Maybe No, I think maybe what I said before about what the covenant actually is is the most important thing. Here I'm trying to get at a kind of objection that, wait, how can there be a covenant? How can we make covenants stick by making a covenant, right? And then so I'm trying to claim that this is a special covenant. Maybe that's not the right answer, but there's some answer like that. And then once you get that answer, you get the rest. Okay. Are there questions about that? Are people clear on what I was worrying about when I started? That's what I often, I'm afraid often when I go off onto these things about, and then now the answer to this problem is this, that people don't are, what maybe didn't understand the problem. Okay, one person got it. That's good. <laughs> I have a whole audience here. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so I mean, um, the other thing to try to make clear this time is exactly how far this authorization goes and what that means about. 
the powers of sovereignty according to Hobbes. Now, I'm obviously not going to be able to get to all the details of that in the next five minutes, but I want to first of all make the point. So, okay, um, again, usually when I appoint someone my agent or authorize them to bear my person, it's for particular limited ends, right? So I give them the right to buy potatoes for me, but not to do anything else. So if they go off and buy rutabagas instead, I don't have to pay for them because I didn't authorize that. Um, so what have we authorized the sovereign to do on our behalf? Um, well, basically the answer is... Um, Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to open up the book and read this, but he says it right there in the same paragraph I was reading from, chapter 17, section 13. We've authorized the sovereign, quote, in those things which concern the common peace and safety. Right? Like, so for example, I haven't authorized the sovereign to buy potatoes for me unless that's something that concerns the common peace and safety. Right. So uh, like if it turns out that these potatoes are critical to national security, then this, then I've authorized the sovereign to buy them. That, that me paying for these potatoes is critical to national security. Then I have authorized the sovereign to buy them on my behalf. But since normally it's indifferent to the public interest, whether I buy these potatoes or not, based on the whole, I haven't authorized that. So, in a sense, this is this view of government is actually quite limited, right? It's not absolute monarchy or aristocracy or democracy in the sense that um, um, the sovereign has all powers to do anything. But there's a catch, <laughs> and it's... <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be interesting. <laughs> yeah, Alana, what time is it? <laughs> all right. Yeah, all right. Anyway, um, <laughs> so um, the catch is who's going to decide whether something is, I mean, actually, this is the real catch with matters critical to national security, right? That who's going to decide whether this is a matter that concerns the common peace and safety or not? That's a question that concerns the common peace and safety, right? So I have authorized the sovereign to, to decide that. And that means that whatever kind of limits there are on the powers of the sovereign are not enforceable by the subjects. Sorry. They don't, right? I mean, of course, we might have the power to enforce them, but we don't have the right to enforce them. And if we try to, we'll be getting, heading back to the state of nature. So that makes Hobbes's sovereign hard to distinguish from an absolute sovereign. Right? They only have certain powers, and Hobbes lists what the powers are um, in chapter 18. Or is it chapter 19? Anyway, one of these chapters. right? Hobbes has an entire list, just like he has a list of the whatever it was, 17 laws of nature. He has a list of all the laws all the powers of the sovereign. The sovereign, you know, doesn't have or need not have powers beyond that. Um, but if a dispute arises about whether something is an exercise of one of those powers or not, the only judge of that dispute is the sovereign. So obviously that means that... Um, um, uh, well, at least it's not clear in what way we can rely on these limits at all. We have no right to try to enforce them. That much is clear. 
So even if the sovereign does something that's just clearly not attached to one of these things and is clearly out of their own private interest, um, and they say, I'm not sure what happens if they don't say this, but they say, I had to do it for reasons of common peace and security. Um, we're obliged to put up with it. Um, all right, I'm out of time. Again, I guess I'm going to put a little over till next time. Um, but I guess I'll just say, of course, this is starting to sound like it might be a bad idea, especially because we can't change our mind about it later. Because again, if later we said, no, no, wait, we want to change. We want to vote for this instead. We already gave all our votes to the sovereign. <laughs> so um, it would be too late. So, uh, right, so it may start to sound like this is a bad idea. Hobbes' argument why it's not a bad idea is basically that although this could lead to very bad things, obviously, not as bad as we think, he claims, but still, it could lead to very bad things, he admits. Nothing could be as bad as the state of nature. That's going to be his argument. And this is the only way out. Okay, on that note, <laughs> I will see you next week.